Okay. So we are so grateful to have Sam Ward with us today, who is going to demystify AI and machine learning, um, a simpler look at complex systems. Sam started coding when he was six years old, um, originally with cybersecurity and moved over to um, AI. Besides coding, he enjoys sci-fi, sewing, coffee, and running tri or doing triathlons. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Uh, let's see if we can get this to work. Thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, that's the correct thing. And then if I do this and swap that, we should. Rachel, is that all working your end? Can you see my slide? I can see it. Sorry, I was muted. But yes, I can see no. the PowerPoint. Fantastic. Um, so, I mean, first of all, we can uh, also see your notes, too. Oh, really? That's yeah. annoying. That's cool. No worries. We know what I'm going to say now. OK, so, now I'm now we're good. OK, that's fine. No worries. Cool. So uh, I think, first of all, I just say thank you for uh, having me. Um, uh, Collab Lab is something that I found, I think, through Andrew originally, but I really like what you guys are doing. Um, uh, you know, uh, and it's great to be involved. Um, so first of all, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to give a talk. Um, and secondly, I suppose, as Richard said, this is kind of a it's supposed to be a talk on demystifying AI, uh, kind of a simpler look at some some of the more complex stuff we do. It's a big topic to cover in 45 minutes, so doubtably I'm going to miss some things. Um, but hopefully, this is going to be kind of a, a high level kind of look at look at AI. So I'm Sam. Um, I'm a principal engineer um, in an AI lab, um, but you know, we'll come back to me a bit later. Hopefully I'm the least, least kind of interesting part of this presentation. Hopefully there's some other more interesting things. So I'll put my stuff at the end, um, just because I want to get through as much of this as possible. Um, so I guess uh, without further ado, on with the show. Um, I think one of the first questions that we should ask is why do we even need AI? Um, it, it's something maybe it's overlooked um, sometimes and the question doesn't get asked as often as it should. Um, but I guess the question is what it is. And um, the answer really is that every day we've got more and more complex sets of data. Every day we've got more and more people online. Every day we're collecting more and more data. And it becomes almost impossible to process that as a human. Um, becomes you know almost impossible to draw relationships and see and see kind of interesting and novel kind of um, emergent properties of that data. You know, um, it just becomes impossible and boring. So one of the kind of I guess one of the reasons we need it is to to get us away from doing the boring processing work. And the other one is so that we can see those novel kind of um, really interesting features that come out of analyzing this, this vast, these vast amounts of data. I mean, it, without digging into too much detail, the first really important thing is kind of med medical advances. We're able to use AI to find problems on scans, specific characteristics of other, uh, other medical tests far faster and with far more accuracy than we would do with humans, right? So that's a really, that's a really kind of, it's a specific use case, but I think it's a really, really important use case. And it highlights the importance of AI and why we need it. Um, I guess then, you know, the next question is um, AI and ML, kind of what's the difference? And the more you dig into this world, and the more you're part of the AI and ML world, AI and ML world they get used kind of interchangeably. People use them for, to mean different things. And that can get confusing. Even as someone that's in the AI world, it gets, can get confusing. So I guess I'll get back. Um, artificial intelligence is really the end goal, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to the point where we've got um, machines that can think like humans um, and, and kind of exhibit their capabilities and behavior. Um, you know, and when you really look at it, I think it's something we've always been trying to do, right? Back from, you know, if we look back to Da Vinci, you know, Da Vinci and his kind of automaton and robots. Um, and even further back, Hephaestus. And, you know, when you look at kind of the human condition, I suppose we've always been trying to create something which is like us. We've always been trying to create subsets of us. And I think really interestingly, that's probably because in trying to build, in building that intelligence, we're trying to understand our own intelligence a bit more. You know, so I think it's a part of the human condition. AI as a concept is about, you know, um, making machines that, that can think like humans. ML is, or machine learning, is really the methodologies and the, and the practical, pragmatic ways by which we do it. Kind of the algorithmic approaches, the, the, um, the 
systems that we build um, and they you know we probably don't even know we're using some of them you know so things like search engines that are optimized to us and to the way we speak and to the way we talk and to the into the language that we use that's ai and ml um, or even things that live in our homes now that are becoming more and more commonplace and just in case someone's got one i say i'll say a l e x a in case it triggers it um you know these things are in our homes and they become part of our lives and they optimize our lives they make our lives better they allow us to do different things they allow people with disabilities to interact with the internet in ways that people you know otherwise couldn't um so ml is the is the is the kind of engineering that drives or gets us towards ai and then we have deep learning which is a subset of ml or a you know built upon ml it's it's kind of a multi it's more of a multi layers layers of ml to deliver deeper research deeper understanding of 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 complex of, of complex data um so the difference there sometimes is that with machine learning we're giving it a training set you know we're giving it some data to train on creating a classification model or whatever we're doing maybe it's a classification with getting it to result with deep learning often we're looking for the deep learning to kind of find patterns find relationships find unseen kind of um or hitherto unseen uh, relationships in data by looking at the at the learning that we've done previous to that point and expanding on it so deep learning is kind of is is the is the extension of ml and it gets us that one step closer to ai um i guess the next question after that is where did we start um and it's a bit of a you know it's a bit of a hard thing to pin down um but you know because of my kind of predilections i i like to think that you know it started back with alan turing um when he created the first co kind of code breaking machine back in world war ii that was the first time that we had a machine that was really capable of thing capable of complex kind of mathematical um problem solving um and that's i think where we uh where we started having the, the thoughts about AI and ml and from there there was papers written there was work done specifically by some some guys in the 50s new all simon and shaw and they came up with a thing called the logic theorist um which was uh this program that could think and act like a human mostly they, they developed it as a bit of a kind of tech test and it was to solve um, Principia Mathematica. They kind of work through solutions and problems. Um, and of course, everyone knows, that, you know, the, the Kasparov kind of story in Deep Blue beating him. And we'll kind of come to that a bit later. So, you know, the kind of the origins of AI. But when you look at it, 1950s to kind of the, the, the emergence and kind of the, the, the kind of ramp up of AI in the 2000s, 2010s onwards, what took us so long to get here? I suppose, and um, it's really down to lack of compute power. Moore's law has been our friend. You know, we've we've got more and more advanced compute, and now we're at the point where we can, you know, start to to to, to really have compute power sufficiently powerful enough to to drive these AIs. But even if we had the compute power back then, because we still kind of use the same kind of approaches and algorithms, we couldn't drive those AIs. We didn't have the data. Data didn't exist in the vast data data lakes that it exists now. In the data mass wasn't there. The data really there was no way of learning um so it, it, it's kind of a, a convergence point that's happened which is um which gets us to ai it, it's it's having the, the the powerful machines having the available having the available compute and also having the data that's what gets us to here um and i think you know that leads me into the next confusing part which you know we have the different layers and ai and ml and deep and in deep learning but there's also different types of ai um and they all do different things um and they have different use cases so i think the first one um is oh that's my slides going slightly wrong there look uh reactive machines um so reactive um machines are just that they react to uh they react to some information they've got directly in front of them um but they don't learn right so if we were to look at that in kind of an example um a reactive machine was actually what beat gary kasparov right this is a it's not they're not, they're not kind of useless machines even now but they are you know they are kind of a a, a, a more primal version of ai and a reactive machine can look at the look at the situation in front of it um and look at the variables and the inputs and make a decision about the next thing to do um, but it's not thinking about the game it's not thinking about 
the state of the game. It's not thinking about any any games it's played before. It's got no concept of the world that it exists in. Um, so they work by taking some variables in and basically all the moves that, that, that could be had have an associated weight or value. And then it determines the most value that it can get for the next move. Um, and, and that's the move that it makes. It's, it's kind of thinking maybe a move ahead in theory, but no more than that. Um, so that's, that's a reactive machine. Um, after reactive machines, we come into the more modern AI, I suppose. And this is the thing I think that most people think of when they're talking about AI. Um, limited memory. So these can continually learn. They can exhibit some really interesting behaviors that hitherto have not been exhibited in computing. Reinforcement learning, for example, these are, these are kind of the, some, of the, some of the more um, common things. Reinforcement learning, long short-term memory, LSTM and GAN, they're all variants on neural nets, kind of the modeling of a human brain and how they work. Um, and they can do some really interesting things. You know, um, they have some really interesting kind of exhibit some really interesting behavior and, and some attributes. Um, the first thing is adaptive learning. So adaptive learning is used, you know, with AIs that kind of talk to humans, right? So they're kind of trying to tailor a, 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 a data, a return value to you based upon your inputs and your communication with it. So they will work with you to determine the best data to get back to you. So search engines are, are a kind of adaptive AI. Um, because they're delivering back the, the data that you want based upon the information that you searched for in the past. It's, you know, it, it, that's an example of them. Uh, language learning systems, you know, people, pe people learning languages now are learning languages far faster, things like Duolingo and um, I forget the Rosetta Stone, if that's still a thing, um, a, a, a tailored uh, kind of communicative two-way AI, two-way kind of communication AIs that, that help you learn a language. Um, the next thing is self-organization, so clustering, right? Um, AIs are able to see patterns in data and cluster them. It, kind of limited memory, AIs see, see patterns in data and cluster them, you know, and find and find relationships in data, um, which is great for kind of uh, more complicated visual systems and and um, I suppose finding those relationships so in my experience areas that i've used stuff like this is in is in um, insurance analysis so when you're looking to find patterns in medical insurance um kind of fraudulent behavior to a degree you can cluster against known good outcomes and then look for known bad outcomes um so there's some real kind of obviously real world use cases for that fault detection is the last one which is probably a bit of a misnomer to a degree. It can mean several things. Obviously, if you can detect what good looks like, you know what bad looks like. Um, so it's great for, for doing kind of complex um, classification and then chucking out, chucking out um, the, the errors, I suppose. But fault detection can also mean generation of data that's missing, right? So you might, you detected the fault, but what should it have been? We detected the missing data, but what should it have been? That's kind of a generative, ad, generative adversary in your network. They're able to look at the information in, a, in, in kind of the expected information, I suppose, and based upon the information that they've been shown in the past, determine what should be there, which is really a fascinating area to explore. And things like Netflix use it for, 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 correct, for correction of, of, of data. It's used in kind of image processing when there's, when there's corruption and, and all sorts of things. So those are some of the key attributes and why they're good. I guess, how do they work is the next thing. So if we're just looking at kind of building a classifier, and this is a bit of a, a trivial, trivial kind of nominal, um, nominal kind of uh, example, but it, it holds true. Um, if we want to classify what a shape is, then we have to show the machine, you know, uh, hundreds if not thousands of examples of that shape, right? Uh, and that's what builds up our, our learning training set. Um, and 
really what the machine cares about is the features associated with those shapes. And features is a term that pops up again, will pop up again and again in AI. And the feature really is, is well, it's just that. It's something about the, the object that we're trying to classify, which is unique to that object, or maybe not unique to the object, but th that object always contains. So for us, this would be a feature of a triangle is it's got three vertices, or a feature of a rectangle, it's got four vertices, and, and so on and so on and so on. We're labeling those as features, but we're not telling the machine, you know, what they are, how they're, it, it, it's determining really what's important. That's what the, 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 the uh, training is doing. It's selecting or creating um, pathways to determine when we show it new data, which classification comes out. And that's done through um, uh, layers of ne neurons, right? And those neurons dictate when you put information in, the path that, that, that it flows through. And there's a whole heap of mathematics behind that that I don't really want to get into because we'll be here for the whole presentation. Um, but that's the that's classification. The next thing that AIs and ML um, are used primarily for is kind of prediction. Um, and this is a bit of a hard thing to show. But if, for example, we had like some historic data sets, A, B, and C, um, and this was weather data, climate data, um, over enough time, we can start seeing the emergent features and properties and the, the causal links between, say, a storm in March and some, some other occurrence in June, right? In a specific, obviously, it's all contextual and location based. So, this is what the, um, this is what AIs can do within, within climate change, for example, which is a really interesting space to explore. Um, Again, the, the core, the kind of core mathematics behind this is something called constraint modeling, or kind of, um, or can be called constraint modeling, uh, or mixed integer programming. This is the same kind of approach. We're exposing the AI to colossal amounts of data, training it, and then we're able to find predictions, or, or kind of, or, or we're not able to find predictions. It's able to make predictions about what should happen next based upon the information it's seen in the past. Um, but again, data sets, exposing it to data, training iterative process. Um, so back to the chess example, I suppose. Um, previously, we were not really thinking about state or, uh, um, or kind of looking towards the future or kind of thinking about games, games that the machine has played in the past. With limited memory AI, um, we, for example, could take uh, some information about the state of the game now um, and look at every game that that machine's played and look at every game that machine's won and look at the occurrence of, of a game state similar to the one that it sees now and plan a route through that, which gets us, gets us to winning as fast as possible, right? So the next move isn't just the next move that, that, that's the most, most advantageous for the most value in the next kind of in, in the next game state it's it's the next move that makes that moves you towards a better game state it gets you closer towards winning um and again that is done for example we would have a, a, a huge data set and we would start classifying game states we'd start classifying outcomes and relationships and we'd start building them anyway and the ai is unable to learn we were at game state a i want to get to winning What's the next? What's the next best game state? I think critically as well. The other thing to think about is that this is this is not um, this is not a, a direct comparison. We're not comparing. Say for example, if we had like a a game state we'd never seen before, we will have a game state which is close to it. Right. That's the other real power of AI is is fuzzy logic and um, precise and precision. Right. We we are close to knowing the answer, so we can use something we've seen before. If we, if I've never heard um, a certain phrase spoken before, but I've heard something similar to it, the AI, AI is able then to make a make a judgment that it's close enough. That's your confidence confidence rating that it's that it's going to make that uh, make that jump, um, and uh, and you know and classify it and move forward. So I guess um, all of all of that is collected under narrow stroke weak AI. Um, that's what it's called, limited kind of neural nets, limited limited memory uh, called narrow and weak AI, which is a bit of a misnomer because I think that kind of, that makes them seem, you know, uh, limited in focus and use and ability. But what it basically means is they are all task oriented. So they can only do one thing, they do that one thing really well. 
um, better than people often, um, but they're focused on, they've been trained to do one thing. They can play chess, they can recognize a flower, they can recognize if something's a cat or a dog, but they couldn't do both. Um, that's why they're called narrow and weak AI. That, there's a limitation to them. And, and we as people aren't narrow or weak. We are able to kind of um, do many things, bake a cake, play chess, um, varying degrees of success, somewhere in between. Uh, I suppose some examples of, uh, we've kind of gone, gone through some examples, but I think it's important to kind of highlight some examples of AI that we see every day that maybe we don't think about. Google is one of them. As I said, search engines are a real AI optimized um, solution that we probably don't even think about, but they are. Um, we interact with them on a daily basis. They deliver us results. They really kind of govern the way that we get information at this point. Um, Alex, uh, sorry, ALX EA, in case anyone's got one, um, is the same thing. Critically, I think the outcome here is the important thing. Google, for one, um, it's, it's AI has, has, has enabled us to find information more quickly. It's collected that information. It's clustered that information in the background. Um, it's, it's delivered that to us in a way which has expedited our learning or expedited our ability to find data. It's, it, you know, it's, whether you agree with the algorithms they use or not, you know, it delivers the data faster. Amazon has not only opened the world up to different forms of communications with communication with machines, it, it's also opened up um, the, you know, the availability of information to maybe people that can't use computers in the conventional way, can't use data entry in the conventional way. So that's a really valuable thing. And whether you like Tesla or not, depending on your personal views um, of, of, the, of the founder, um, they are the first company that's brought machine vision to to the world right they, they've done it they, you know, they, they, it's out there they've got self-driving cars so that's we're, we're kind of at the, at the realms of kind of we're in we're in the realms of narrow ai today we can we can train data we can we can train we have a huge data sets we can train ais to, to do to do singular tasks but that's not not really a reflection of what the brain does right i suppose um or, or it's not really a reflection of, of of a human it's it's a subset of a human it's a it's a vertical slice of something that we can do um so i guess tomorrow there is the goal of we can move more into towards the goal of ai and the theory of mind um and self-awareness so the theory of mind is kind of teaching machines to recognize emotion teaching machines to be able to exhibit emotion um, and I guess self-awareness is self-awareness, right? We're trying to get to the point where we can teach machines to think and to be able to, to have, um, uh, I suppose it's called general intelligence, be able to kind of question where they are, what they're doing. Um, and that sounds like science fiction, but we're not too far off. Um, we just have to think about things slightly differently, um, which kind of gets me into kind of the world of tomorrow, which is really where I, I tend to spend most of my life. So there are different approaches to AI. We've kind of talked about um, neural nets and that's one approach to, to AI. And that's the most prevalent out in the world that you're going to encounter. And, you know, it, we can come onto the specific bit of technology in a minute that you're, that you're likely to encounter. Um, but there are other approaches. Um, Typically, genetic algorithms are emergent at the moment. Um, specifically, what is, is, is a, an, an AI that I like, um, and I'm watching called Perceiver, um, and they build they build on genetic base. Right, so genetic algorithms are, are really interesting because genetic algorithms work by um, breeding over time and produce and picking the best possible candidate through generations, which is different to the way that neural nets work, which is a kind of a more, um, it's gradient descent. So it's, 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 a, it's a mathematical function on how they get to their result. Genetic algorithm is a bit, is a bit different. So it, it's, there's more, there's more um, opportunity for it to go wrong, but there's also more opportunity for it to breed novel results, right? Uh, results that aren't the same every single time. Um, so, Genetic algorithms are, are kind of are coming around and they're, and they're emerging and they're great at solving kind of optimization problems. They're great at solving um, solutions that may may not may not be able to solve with a with a with a neural net or not as fast. Um, so more multivariate, more um, uh, wider kind of wider problem sets. Um, 
And then we kind of come into my playground. Um, so we've touched on um, supervised learning, really, primarily, which is giving a data set to an AI and teaching it uh, and telling it what's what, right? Giving it some features, saying this is a circle, this is a square, this is a chessboard, this, these are the way the pieces, this is what this is what a pawn looks like, this is what a queen looks like, or you know, in a in a, in a human in a picture of a face, this is where all the features of the face are. But I mean that that what we're doing there is to a degree is we're setting a limit to how much that machine can learn. We're already we're already setting the upper limit. It's going to learn these things. It's going to learn these features. I tend to work with self-supervised learning, so unsupervised, or as it was called now, it's called self-supervised, um, which it, it chucks a load of data on a machine and basically says, "You figure it out. You you tell me where the relationships are. You tell me where the um, whether whether whether." Um, where the patterns are right um and my, my i guess my field of research my, my personal research is um representation of data in a quantum field um so data goes away from being represented in kind of ones and zeros and gets represented as probabilities um and those probabilities can be moved so it, essentially what we've got here on the top right is a um is a self-sorting, um, self-deterministic uh, language, uh, a representation of language. So neurons are allowed to move or, or they're allowed to roam in a network. Um, and initially they have no position, but as they become categorized with, as language gets used, they move close to each other. And the fascinating thing there is um, in the bottom of this picture, you can self-sort and self-categorize and, and, self and, and have a kind of a self-determined neural network, which, can give better results, but also can take longer. Um, I guess that's the critical thing when it comes to, to AI is when to use it and when not to use it as well. Um, it's, you know, quite often the problem you're trying to solve, you could solve it with AI or you could solve it with just some plain kind of coding and mathematics. There's no, sometimes there's no need for AI is what I'm saying. And that's a thing to remember. The other thing to remember, which I, I didn't actually mention, I should have mentioned, which was back at the um, back a couple of slides ago, was the responsibility we have within AI. Um, so to really think about the outcomes of that, I suppose it does play into this here. Bias is a huge thing in AI, and I think everyone's aware of that, right? So we have a responsibility to police the data sets that we put out there and and really make sure that it's representative of, of uh, you know it's not an unbalanced data set it's representative of the outcome that we want and also consider the human impact of the ai that we're producing because there is normally humans at the end of this and it's important to remember that we're not just you know building a technological outcome there could be a it could have direct impact on people's lives um so that's an important thing to, important thing to, to to kind of remember um yeah i mean that's that's kind of a, an overview of the AI. Now, the places to start, there are a myriad of places to start, and I'll share this deck afterwards because there's a lot of links actually that I can, I can share. Um, I think there's some really interesting projects to, that you can jump in with. Um, I found like uh, image processing and image analysis really interesting, and there's some great libraries out there in Python. Um, SciPy, and it was called Scikit, um, but there's a machine learning learn and, and kind of programming uh, library out there um, called SciPy, which is great for kind of um, machine vision and image processing. There's some kind of off the shelf stuff that you can do with that that's fascinating. Image comparison, image and image, looking at features within an image. And that's actually feeds you in, then into understanding, okay, well, how do I detect a feature in an image? Um, how can I then label that image? How can I then build an AI? Um, and I think the two most prevalent technologies in the industry today that are used synonymously across organizations is TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are neural nets. And we'll when you build those, when you build those out, you, you're defining kind of the hidden layers. You're defining your your kind of presentation. You're defining how those neural nets are built, and you're defining the data set. But the technology underneath it is going to be Py, Py, TensorFlow and PyTorch more often than not. There are novel occasions where that isn't the case, but I would say ninety percent of the time it is. Both of those are great places to start. The two links here have like brilliant tutorials, and I couldn't do a, a, a good as good a job as explaining really how they fit together and what they do um you know that's what the tutorial is there for it guides you through the journey and i would say it's not daunting um people might think that this is uh, something which is beyond their ability to understand or 
you know, it, it, it's not something they can, they can tackle. It's not at all. It's dead easy. Um, these environments are easy to use. They're not, they're not, you know, everything is step by step and, and it's, it, AI is just very, very, com very, very large amounts of very simple logic, right? When you think about it, we all think in very simple terms. It's just, you know, like calculators are, they don't do what, 100 times 132, they just count, you know, that's how they work from, a, from an, electronic, an electronic point of view. Machines are no different, this is how AI works. It's just doing that far faster than we can think. And if you approach it with that kind of logical mindset, there's nothing scary inside here. It, anyone can tackle this. Um, anyone, and it can become part of a, of, of a programming tool set, which is incredibly valuable. I think that gets me back to me, um, which is probably the least interesting, the least interesting part of this. Um, so who am I? Um, I guess um, right now I'm a principal engineer um, in the AI labs at Blue, Blue Prism. I've been coding since I was six. I've been, it's all I've ever done, 15 years, I suppose, plus more in, in, in engineering. Um, uh, began in pen testing, um, worked for all sorts of people, British Telecom, British Arms Aerospace, um, GCHQ, um, in the cybersecurity space, um, and then into, into, into the big data, big data space too. I've worn many hats and worn many hats badly. I've made loads of mistakes and um, taken down a lot of systems. Uh, that's, that's kind of it. My, my passions, I suppose, with this work is that AI is something which we should all be moving towards. My, my focus is on artificial consciousness, not AI specifically. Um, intelligence being a manifestation of consciousness. Um, so I think the critical thing there is to build something that's conscious first and then hope that it develops an intelligence. And I'm kind of a fingers crossed guy. I like I like chaos and emergent principle. So I'm <laughs> the other ends and neural nets, which are more traditional and predictable, and they get the results. I prefer the chaotic end of AI, which is um, which is where I like to work. Um, that's pretty much it. Experience across n number of languages. Take your pick, really. Um, and that's that's the lot. So I'm happy to answer. Any questions? Um, yeah, for, for the remainder of the time that we have. I've gone a bit short. I apologize, Rachel. Um, it's a hard thing to plan. So, no, no, no. Um, you were, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, and then far away, any questions? Absolutely any questions at all. Sure. Even if it's not AI specific, go for it. Yeah. Um, and feel free to ask a question in the chat or, sure. oh, I see some in the chat already. Or if you want to unmute yourself and ask Sam directly. Um, I can read this to you. Um, so Ben A, Benjamin asks, how would Sam recommend approaching AI as a career option for anyone who doesn't exactly know what they want to do career-wise? Great <laughs> question. Um, how would you approach it as someone uh, that is approaching AI for someone's career option doesn't really know? I mean, the first advice to anyone is get stuck in, get involved, get, 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 get really start playing with the code because I find with every engineer that I talk to, more often than not, they have something they want to build in the back of their mind and they're always never building it. They're always building something for someone else. And I think that, that with this kind of stuff, get stuck in, get involved, um, pick, a, pick a simple solution that you think you can build. Maybe it's just like, uh, um, can you teach your machine to recognize your face when you say that kind of Windows hello, right? But why does that work? And you're never gonna get, probably never gonna get it as efficient as Windows hello because you haven't got the budget of Microsoft. But you'll understand such a lot when you build that thing. And then having that project when you go into uh, an organization and kind of have a conversation with them professionally, you can say, well, look, I built this thing. And they can never question that really, um, because you've probably learned an awful lot and they can't say it's good or bad because it works. And the critical thing there is that you've built something that works that uses AI. Um, you've taken something which is, uh, was, was nothing and developed an outcome for it, right? There's, it's, it's a really powerful thing to have when you go into any kind of, but like <sighs> working, I suppose career option for anyone doesn't exactly know what they want to do career-wise. Um, yeah, just start, just start playing with AI. I think start playing with code in general. Maybe it's not AI that's your passion. Maybe it's something else, but start playing with code. Start trying to do as much as possible. Anna, 
Any other questions? Anything other? Is there a resource um, that you can point us to for ideas on projects we can work on? No, I mean, other than, other than the resources which I share uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, is there a resource? Um, no, I don't think I don't, I don't know. Not not one uniform resource, I suppose. There's a, there's all there's, there's the there's the there's the resources I'll share, and then it comes back down to the the specific solution or, or problem that you have that you want to solve. I think, um, and then once you know the problem you want to solve, you can kind of find the resources you need to drive that or, or, or solution that problem. Um, that's probably the 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 obvious answer. Um, and, and other than the ones I'll share, like the, the, super, the, the super easy kind of introductory, introductory primers. Um, other than that, that's, that's, that's it. I know because I've done a little bit on my own that like, so I know that TensorFlow has tutorials both with Python and the TensorFlow.js, which if you're, it's JavaScript with Node. And also if you're always looking for data sets, Kegel, is that how you say it? Kegel is great. Yeah. Um, exactly. And that there's tons of, yeah, there's, yeah. So that's and even if, yeah, exactly. The data sets exist. Um, there we go. And then yeah, TensorFlow has tutorials um, in both Python and JavaScript for like image classification and other like audio stuff, all that stuff. Um, so the other question is, uh, are, uh, are there any are there any collaborations that can compensate for lack of job experience? I think so. For me personally. Um, uh, I think bringing your own project is, is invaluable to, to, to any kind of tech interview straight meeting, regardless of AI or not. Um, it's something which shows that you can take an idea and build a product or a solution, because that's what we're trying to do. Um, it's, it's, you know, anyone that's writing code, right, when it's not about, I think we forget that too often, that's certainly the case in a lot of tech, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of technical interviews. Um, I, I don't really think they show people off at the best light sometimes. So I think really you have to think about the what we're trying to all do is build the something that works, right? Whether the code is perfect, whether it's like the, the, the most up-to-date way of doing something, doesn't really matter. If you show you can build something end-to-end, -end, that's what people really care about, you know? And then it comes back down to attitude and, uh, and culture fit. That's kind of the important thing. I think again, I'm I'm kind of biased. I don't like technical interviews, so um, yeah. I mean, if any other questions? Oh God, next big problem. There are so many big problems right now, right? Um, I think climate change is a huge one that AI can help with, and it is helping with it. You know, it's being used by oil companies. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but they're out there using AI to solve some problems that they've got. It's being used to solve kind of, I mean, let's look at it. It's using energy density is a big thing, right? Energy density in batteries is a huge thing. That's why we don't have as many electric, or why we don't have electric cars that have larger ranges, right? Which is ultimately why we don't have as many people using electric cars because the use cases don't align. So using AI or kind of um, uh, prediction or like kind of, uh, pattern uh, or I guess search-based technology to look for the most likely highest highest kind of density um, energy solution that we can get within a data set um, is a great way of kind of, of, of looking at AI. Or even like if you were to look at the, 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 the why do people move around as much? How could we optimize people's movements if they don't use as much fuel, right? That delivers the same result, but not in the same way. I, yeah, I think it, the other thing is, um, I think it's going to come pretty quickly, is kind of in-home AI, conversational AI. We all converse differently, we have different colloquial ways of, of conversing, but when we, when we want information, we request it in a certain way. We're kind of getting there with Amazon and other kind of in-home like in devices, but they are still using kind of a global model of how people talk, when in reality it should be with kind of in the, in, within the, in your environment and, 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 and able to work with the information that you want and collect and learn from you. I think that's probably coming. And I don't know if that opens up more doors, right? Maybe that opens up doors for, for interacting with, um, or, or getting more people on board and interacting with. 
there isn't a typical day, isn't there? I know, Mum, do you know? Um, <laughs> I think that's, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's going to be different in any organisation, um, I think. You know, uh, there's typically it's it's a lot of it's a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of thinking around a problem. It's a lot of um, it's a lot of uh, investigation and planning to a degree um, of and collecting data and making sure you've got the data. But then, you know, there's an awful lot of of of, of course correction as well that goes into that and, and fact and kind of failing fast more often than not, finding a solution, testing it. You know, there's no um, there's no typical day, um, certainly not in my in, in my in my role anyway. Um, I think it's it's a career to get into AI and ML engineers specifically. It, it's it, it's a career to get into because you enjoy it and enjoy a challenge and enjoy critical thinking. There's no other reason to get into it. But I would say that I think AI and ML engineers specifically are probably a dying breed in that we're looking more to have a more diverse much like we have full stack engineers, there's going to creep in with AI and ML into that as well, because it's um, it's uh, it's um, it, having that kind of broader scope allows you to allows more people to build better solutions, right? It's, if I build an AI, it comes from my point of view um, to a degree, and that's a problem. Whereas the more people we can get that have different points of view and different and different kind of experiences that they're able to work with AI and ML, I think that's kind of a better thing to do. So over time, I think it will, we won't have these kind of harsh roles that are, that are, that are defined. Best non-obvious qualities that make a good AI engineer. It's the same, it's, I think it's the same that make a good engineer. It's critical thinking. Because I can teach anyone how to code, I can't teach people how to think. Um, so it, can you solve a problem? Can you write a problem down? Can you think about, um, uh, can you think about that problem in a way that, you know, solves the, it just out of the box thinking, right? I think, which is a, a very blue sky and, and nebulous term to say, but it's, it's thinking around the problem. And I think that makes for a good AI engineer because sometimes the data is missing. Sometimes the data is incomplete. Sometimes you've got to think about where you're going to go and get the data. Where does that data exist? How can you collect that data? How could you go and grab that data from the internet, for example? So it might be an element of, I have to put in place three steps to get the data that I want. And then there's three steps to clean the data and, and prep the data. And then I can train my AI, right? Now in a huge organization, maybe those steps have been done. That's probably someone else's role to go and get that data for you. But if you're able to think about where data comes from and the provenance of that data and why it's important to go and get it, that'll make you a better AI engineer. It'll make you appreciate the outcome more and it'll make you, um, I guess, hopefully build a, a better AI. And Millie's question, uh, actually that was the not obvious. And, and I think the question before that was, what's the next big project you would personally like to work on? I, it's the big project that I've been working on since I was 12 years old. Um, which is artificial consciousness, um, which is the, is, the, is the big thing, right? There, there isn't, a, again, there's just, it, it's, a, it's an unknown, there's no time limit on this, there's no, there's, no, there's no fitness factor for when it's done, it's just done when it's done. Um, that's, my, that's my project. I mean, that's the big project. Um, I also, personally, I like optimization problems. Um, I like um, mathematical optimization problems, so that tends to be the projects I enjoy working on most. Um, yeah. Oh, well, uh, any other questions? Yeah, any other last minute questions or? Well, Thank you so much, Sam. That was really wonderful. Um, I appreciated how you were able to break it down. Oh, oh there is one more, and it says, what, what kind of yeah. Was it, what kind of data do you usually do? I I I'll kind of interpret that um, in the way that I think it's used. Do do I usually use? Um, it depends on the problem set. Um, so there's no there's no kind of usual data specifically. Uh, I mean, typically, um, so it could be kind of uh, mixed kind of when it comes when it comes to me, for example, uh, in an in insurance data set, for example, you've got various different data types. Um, so it's normalizing those for a start. 
um, but it could be image analysis, in which case it's it's a collection of images and then it's pre-processing those images and correcting them. It, it really does depend on the outcome. I'm spread across um, NLP, um, machine vision, and um, kind of more prediction straight Bayesian classification stuff. So it, there's three different kind of data sets that all drive that. Um, NLP being language, and you can go and grab huge data sets for language. Like they're, they're publicly available and they're great. Um, or you can work from the ground up and go and build one from the English language or whatever language. It's a very binary view of language, I suppose, but I'm English, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if that helped. Um, it, if it didn't, then feel free to ask, ask me again and I'll try and get it. Fantastic. Um, my favourite AI representation of the movies, uh, 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 Ex Machina, I think is the closest. Um, we've probably come to representing um, AI accurately to a degree, because the, the fabric in which the AI exists inside Ex Machina is probably close to what you'd need to build. It's a kind of bioengineered um, Kind of a kind of a, a fabric with electro electromagnetic properties, which, if you were to say, so, um, some of the kind of more advanced stuff that's being done is um, with uh, superfluid kind of superfluid gases, um, or, or kind of technically the Boltzmann gases. So they're, they're kind of um, I suppose that's what they call these perfect gases, but that's more the, the the advanced stuff because you can represent data in some really interesting ways. Data can imprint imprint in the gas inside this perfect gas which has got you know a, a, a homogeneous density when you start and then you can do it so when you look at it from a pure physics science point of view um i think ex machina comes close because the fabric that they build the ai on is kind of the fabric you'd need to build to store the same amount of information when you look at kind of neurology as well inside the human the, the human brain um there's some really interesting stuff that goes on there um there's some really interesting stuff studies on, studies on anesthetic um, which are fascinating with the way that the human brain works. It's a relatively, relatively small thing, the human brain, we contain so much information. And building a representation of that is not possible with current computing or not without like huge amounts of space. So if you wanted to build that and put it into a smaller space, which you would need to do if you want to have kind of conversable kind of automata, I suppose, in the world. what kind of database do I use? Um... <laughs> Uh, what kind of database? Again, uh, databases are, um, that's a really fanta fantastic question, I think, because data recall and data storage is, 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 is really important for, for, for AI. Um, it, and again, this is going to come down to the tech stack of the organization. Um, more often than not, I hate to say it, SQL is still a huge thing. You know, SQL's out there, SQL's being used by everyone has been since 2000 or whenever before that, mid 90s, will continue to be used. If you can get away from that, there are some other really great databases, Cosmos, Prometheus, um, uh, I forget what the name of the SAP and memory database is, which have like higher throughput, or you've got more queryable databases, Elastic Cache or Elasticsearch, or um, Prometheus is one of those two, they're, they're highly queryable, um, non-relational databases. But on the database side of things, there again is no wrong and no right. Um, Interestingly, if you've got a very structured data set and you want to query that data set, if, it, if it's highly structured, SQL's fine. It, it's absolutely fine. It's, it's as performant as, as, no, as NoSQL databases. The NoSQL databases like, like um, graph databases and Neo4j, they're great, but they, they're, they're data specific. So again, it comes down to the right fit at the right time for the right data. It's very hard to say without, um, without kind of analysis of the data you're trying to store. Um, and there is no wrong or no right. More often than not, unfortunately, it's still SQL. Um, or if you're lucky, Mongo, <laughs> which is more prevalent out there now. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, there are more exotic databases. They do things better. But um, primarily, it's probably still, unfortunately, SQL that gets used. Um, awesome. I think there's one question that said, how do you know yeah, that you have a good enough data set for your models? Great question. To a degree, it's down to, 
it's not. So you have to, I was gonna say it's down to data mass, but it's not that, it's not that simple, right? It's not as simple as having enough data because that data run all around, but the same data. And there's no ambiguity or no diversity or no kind of divergence in that data, which is kind of critical for building a stable and 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 and, and um, a reliable model. So it's not just down to the the size of the data you've got; it's down to the diversity in that data. So, if I was going to build a model for, um, uh, I don't know, to classify cats or Dog, just cats, right? Let's just say cats or, or cats or, or dogs, right? But they cats come in different shapes, different sizes, dogs come in different shapes, different sizes. If I were to just build a model on one particular breed of dog and one particular breed of cat, it's really brittle. I can have like 10,000 photos of that one particular type of cat and, and dog. But when I built my model and I compared stuff against it, it would get things wrong all the time. When in reality, what I want is to, is to cover the whole Gaussian, the search space of a cat and what is a dog. Um, in, in kind of a platonic um, platonic way, but so, so platonic models. So classically, Plato said that um, that the perfect chair doesn't exist, right? But in your head, there is what a, there is a picture of what a chair is, um, and that's a platonic golden a golden platonic kind of uh, rule, a golden platonic model, and that's the kind of thing you're trying to build. If I say cats to you, I'm not you're not thinking of a specific cat, but you're thinking of everything that makes the cat. Right? And that's what you want to capture in your data set. If your data set covers that space, that's, that's a good model. Same thing for a dog. That's how you know you've got a good enough data set for your model. But in truth, you don't know until you've trained it and tested it. Um, and that's another whole, uh, whole kind of set of engineering kind of principles that go into testing and training. ML, ML kind of ML models, and it goes back into ML ops. And when do you retrain them? Why do you why do you retrain them? Then you've yeah, there's a whole heap of research into mutation of model and you know, quick mutations and all sorts of things that 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 are um, that, that it becomes problematic. But you know, um, in essence, if you can imagine a cat, then you've got a good good enough data set, broadly speaking. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much for everything. Oh, um, one more. Cool. Yeah. Um, I will be putting the deck on um, the meetup link. Yeah. Um, the meetup link will have, I'll be putting the deck and then I'll do a link to the YouTube and then we'll put it on um, Collab Labs website. Oh, which by the way, if anyone has any idea for um, a talk, if they want to give a talk or know anyone who has, we set up an air table on our website so you can just submit it there as well. Um, yeah, you can submit your idea. And we are giving the talks now, they're monthly on the second Wednesday of every month. So we will see you in November. And thank you so much, Sam. And I hope everyone has a great day. And thank you again for, for, for giving me the opportunity. And um, if anyone's got any questions, regardless if it's AI or not, and you think I can give you an answer, uh, I'm more than happy to try. Maybe I give you, maybe I can't help, but I'm more than happy to try. Uh, and where should they find you? On um, I'm on Twitter. You've got you've tweeted out my 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 Twitter okay. handle. And if not, um, you can just share the email that, that we've been conversing on, Rachel. I'm you know I'm open to to, to talking okay. to help helping anyone I can. Um, I think what you do is great, so I'm more than happy to be involved. Sounds great. Um, yeah, and we'll see you next month. Super.